Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to see so many friendly supporters, members of the Supporters Club here this evening. Um, it is truly a cause and a night for celebration, and I'm very delighted to have the opportunity to chair the inaugural lecture of Professor John Lee, who has been appointed to the personal chair of digital media. My name is Lorraine Waterhouse, and I'm a vice principal in the university. And it's my uh, great honor on behalf of principal uh, to be able to uh, listen to this, tonight's lecture um, and to uh, hear the discussion that we will have an opportunity uh, to participate in after um, John has provided his uh, lecture to us. I do want to say just very briefly a few words about his background because he really brings um, a great deal of experience and contribution to the University of Edinburgh. Um, he's currently de Deputy Director of Human Communication Research Centre, which is in the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. But he's also seconded to informatics and is perhaps one of those rare individuals in the university who crosses disciplinary boundaries, it would appear, effortlessly. He um, has been, in a sense, a long association with the University of Edinburgh, and of that we can be justly proud. He holds a first degree in philosophy from our own university, and a PhD in philosophy and cognitive science, also from this university. He has a widespread of research interests, including areas of communication and cognition in design and learning, including uses of technology to support learning, uh, areas of great interest to the university in its work to try and provide the very best methods um, to support learning, both at undergraduate and at postgraduate level. Um, he's published widely, but what uh, struck me most in his CV was the creation and innovation um, of a system for which he was um, recognized in the Chancellor's Award, um, in which he has devised a method uh, in order to film um, seminars and tutorials by students so that they might play this back and benefit from the, le le the words of wisdom, uh, both from themselves and, and from the group, perhaps if there's others present, and also from whoever is taking the particular class. And it seemed to me an innovation which could have application across the whole of the university. And so, really, you're here tonight to hear his lecture um, to mark this very, very proud occasion. And without more ado, I'm going to ask you, um, John, if you would be so kind as to begin your lecture, which you have titled, Learning Vicariously with Rich Media. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. I um, hope I've got these microphones all sorted out properly. Um, <clears throat> right. So, learning vicariously with rich media um, might be a slightly confusing title in various respects, so I'm going to try and explain as I go along what I mean by these various things. Um, and so here is kind of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the strange case of rich media learning resources, what they are, and um, why we don't make better use of them, perhaps. Um, I think this is a, a sort of interesting and curious topic. Um, and there's something that needs to be better understood about what the potential of these rich media is and why um, they are exploited or not exploited in the ways that they are. Then I'm going to talk um, quite a bit more about vicarious learning. Vicarious learning is a topic that um, I and a number of other people have been involved in working on for quite a while. And um, what I want to do is try and um, get a grip on how and why this perhaps interacts with the use of things like rich media, how we can exploit these um, concepts in tandem to try and develop some um, better ideas uh, about how we can exploit technology in particular in, um, in trying to support learning. 
I'll talk about the um, the system that um, was alluded to in, in the introduction there um, called Utute as an example of how one might do this, but it's just a preliminary example really, and then talk about some further applications and possible future directions. So <clears throat> hopefully um, that won't take any more than 40 minutes. So <clears throat> rich media resources, what do I mean by that? Well, by rich media I mean mainly audio and video, really. Um, there are obviously a whole lot of different kinds of media that one might work with in, um, in all kinds of different contexts. But I'm interested in media which are somehow um, available, especially on the internet, um, media which are digital media, media which are somehow um, media that we can um, get hold of using various kinds of technology. So these are the sorts of media that I'm um, focusing on here. And audio and video are the particular kind of key rich media as far as I'm concerned. But these media can be augmented um, by various other types of information. So one has audio and video, but um, audio and video can be augmented by, for example, links to each other. So you can have different pieces of audio linked together in various ways, different pieces of video, um, or other forms of information or data. So, for example, annotation um, is one possible way of linking these kinds of media to um, other, other information. Uh, one can tag them, of course. Um, one can cross-reference in various ways within the resource, perhaps, link um, one part of the resource to another. One can um, adorn them with commentary, discussion, things like that, pull them together and um, elaborate material around them, which will somehow contribute to um, the sort of um, potential that they have for informing. And one can tie them into wider internet resources of various kinds. So when I talk about rich media, what I mean typically is, um, well, actually video, but also possibly audio, um, but with these kinds of extra um, materials associated around them. And really rich media, um, I would say, are still not really very common, actually. So the potential exists for using these media much more substantially than is actually exploited at the moment. Um, and especially that's the case in education, I think. So in education, we find that people are using video in various ways. I mean, there's a good example of it here, of course. But um, the possible ways of exploiting that video and using it um, in a richer kind of context are typically neglected, I think. And I think it would be useful if we could try to investigate the potential of developing around that in a more substantial way. So what I'm going to try and talk about here this evening is not just um, things that I've worked on in the past and so forth, um, although there will be some of that, certainly. But um, I'm going to try and tie that into thinking about how we can use um, these types of um, research that I and many others have been involved in to take forward, somehow, um, the use of these kinds of media in a more effective way. So here are some examples of um, ways that rich media um, exist or can exist. Um, YouTube, of course, is one of the um, kind of canonical types of rich media nowadays. Everyone knows about YouTube. The fact that you have all these videos there, you can easily look at them, you can search them. What lots of people don't seem to realize is that you can do other things with them as well. So, for example, you can annotate them. Um, so YouTube, in fact, has a, a whole set of um, tools for doing video annotation. Um, which is described on this page here. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about these, but luckily they have a little um, demonstration here, which allows us to see how you might do this. Well, here you can see there's a video, but the video has some um, text, which is um, kind of implanted on top of it. Of course, there's always these irritating adverts, and potentially the sound is too loud, but anyway. Um, so we can scan through this a bit. And uh, eventually, you see, we get some um, further annotations, this little bit here, saying don't forget to add a link, and so on. And um, 
then in fact um, all of these sort of hot spots, these are actually hot spots which have been implanted on the video so that you can um, click on one of them and in fact it jumps to a completely different video. So um, that's, that's quite a nice sort of functionality that um, YouTube have provided for us there. And that, it seems to me, is, um, is a potentially quite useful type of thing that people could exploit somehow or other, um, for example, in education. But mysteriously, they don't seem to be very widely used. It seems to me that um, on YouTube itself, you don't find an awful lot of videos which actually exploit these facilities that um, YouTube have provided for us. And the people, of whom there are quite a few, and perhaps some in this room, who use video for teaching don't very often use these kind of <laughs> facilities either. Another thing that we find um, very prevalent these days is the capturing of university lectures on video. Well, here's one. <laughs> but um, there are lots and lots of them. Um, in fact, these days, um, probably most of the um, lectures in informatics, I think, and certainly um, a lot of the lectures even in other parts of the university are captured on video. Um, there are phenomena like iTunes University, iTunes U as it's called, which um, is provided by Apple, of course, and, and which is used by quite a lot of universities to create collections of videos of their lectures. Um, but it seems to me that um, these things are actually not easy to use collaboratively or creatively. Um, and in fact, it's often not really that clear what you're supposed to do with them. I've got here um, what I suppose is perhaps a typical example. You can see this, this is actually a University of Edinburgh one, so um, you have to get into it in the first place. And then um, when you get into it, in this case, um, it turns out to be a video of me giving a lecture about Flash, but anyway. Um, <laughs> there's, um, there's a couple of uh, useful features that this has. For example, there's, um, there's the lecturer speaking. Here is whatever appears on the lecturer's screen. And um, here is a useful series of um, indexes into the video, which are provided by sort of automatically looking at this um, this video stream here on, on the screen and noticing when things change in salient ways and then um, an index point is put into the video so you can kind of jump to a point over here perhaps where I happen to be talking about um, some aspect of the software. I'm talking about um, Adobe Flash here which is a piece of software that I'm explaining to the students how to do things with and um, you know you can jump to that or some particular point where something is discussed in the notes or um, some point later on where there seems to be a firework display. Anyway, there's various different things which um, one can link to that might happen in this lecture. So in some sense there's a useful um, kind of layer of information on top of, on top of the lecture here. And um, that's quite um, a useful element of rich media. But um, on the other hand, it's somewhat limited. I mean, basically, we can watch this lecture. We can move to different places in it um, on the basis of that um, index sequence. But it's difficult to do much else with it. We can't easily link other things to it. We can't easily um, take pieces of it and use them for something else or whatever. So. Um, there's a, there's a kind of restriction there, which seems as though technologically um, it would actually be quite easy to overcome in some sense, but um, something, I'm not quite sure what really, is, um, is kind of inhibiting people from um, making more creative, fuller use somehow of, of this sort of resource. So I think that um, new models for reuse of material are needed. Um, people who have been around in the area of, um, of um, computer-based education, e-learning, things like that, um, for a while, will know that um, models for the reuse of material are scarcely a new topic. So for a long time we've had the idea of um, what are often referred to as reusable learning objects. And there are um, you know, standards 
lots of um, European standards, international standards, all kinds of things for um, creating and reusing these learning objects. And there are collections of them in many places which are specific to particular disciplines. Um, you, can get, you can get collections of these things for computer science, for architecture, for history, whatever. Um, but they haven't really become ubiquitous. I mean, a lot of the time these things just aren't used, really. They're there, um, they exist. You can find them on the web, you can find um, uh, kind of um, lists of them, um, indexes into them, but people don't really use them very much. And I think part of the reason for that is that they're not very easy to use a lot of the time. They need um, slightly complicated and obscure technology to use them quite often, but also um, they're kind of built by teachers and they tend to be based on particular ways in which teachers think this material needs to be provided, particular ways in which they think this material needs to be used. And quite often teachers kind of differ on these things. So you'll find that um, there's a, a strong tendency among university teachers not to use resources that are being created by other university teachers a lot of the time. They, they want to um, build their own. So perhaps that's one of the reasons why these things aren't um, used as much as people might originally have hoped. But I think um, what we need to do is move away from those kinds of things to some extent, at least towards more learner-led recruitment of materials from, um, well, from anywhere, from the web in particular, um, so that the students, the learners, can actually find these materials that are interesting, relevant to them, things that actually um, bring something to the problem or the issue that they're grappling with at a particular moment. Um, and they can, you know, draw those materials in, use those materials, do something creative that involves changing and reworking those materials in ways that perhaps involve sharing them um, among each other and collaborating to do that. So sharing and collaboration to kind of achieve search and discovery, um, I think, are important elements of, um, of the ways that we can see improvements um, potentially in, in um, using these kinds of technology. And technology can assist with this recruitment process in all kinds of ways. I mean, obviously, there are things like Google. So Google allows us to find stuff on the internet much more easily than we could before. And increasingly so, there's the semantic web, all kinds of things. Um, but also, <clears throat> within things like rich media, um, audio and video, um, there are possibilities starting to open up for technology to do things like, well, the automated indexing of the video, which we just looked at, um, the lecture video, is one example. But that can be taken much further. I mean, that's done on a rather um, simplistic um, way of um, just looking at where salient changes occur in whatever was on the screen, but perhaps one can um, look at the speech in the, um, in the video, look at in more detail what's happening on the screen, etc., and use these kinds of things to um, give much more clear pointers to what's in these rich media. So I think the potential for learning that these things um, give to us is based on the idea that we can move away from the passive consumption approach we can support activity, reflection, construction, inquiry-led processes, <clears throat> and indeed the, de the development of um, distributed collaborative learning through social networking. Now, these things are all, you know, motherhood and apple pie <laughs> to some extent. Um, people are always saying these things um, in the context of learning, but <clears throat> it's, um, it's actually surprisingly difficult um, very often to really make them fly. And I don't necessarily know that um, I can do that any better than anybody else has managed to in the past. But I think that we have here um, you know, a, a direction for looking in which might give us more potential for making these things really start to work for us than they've tended to um, so far. And in particular, um, what I think people need to be able to do, learners need to be able to do with these kinds of materials, is, um, is get engaged somehow. So I think we need to support the engagement of distributed learners. Now these distributed learners might be distance learners in the sense that um, they might be 
people who are not present on campus, they're distributed around the world, whatever. Um, or they might be um, distributed merely in a rather local sense. Um, they might be people who actually come together in some circumstances, but the rest of the time aren't physically together. Um, but these, these kinds of people are often difficult to keep engaged on a learning task or in a learning kind of framework. And one of the ideas that um, we've worked on in the past, um, as well as more recently, is that this idea of vicarious learning can help with, um, with the engagement of learners, can help with um, bringing learners into a kind of community and getting them to understand what they can get from each other and from working with each other. So <clears throat> what is vicarious learning? I finally come to. Um, well, vicarious learning is um, learning from exposure to the learning experiences of others. That's what the, uh, the name might suggest. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, students learn by watching other students' problem solving in one sense or another. Um, there's plenty of examples of this sort of thing. Master classes in, for example, music or design crits in something like architecture are examples of this. So you have um, typically a teacher who is teaching um, a student, possibly a, a group of students, um, <clears throat> but they're discussing some particular problem, some issue, they're working through something, um, and there's an audience. It might be quite a big audience in a lecture theatre or it might be a small audience standing around a um, a pin-up board in an architecture crit room or whatever it might be, it might be um, the situation that the audience are actually learning by watching the learning process that's taking place um, in front of them. And indeed ordinary tutorial groups are probably an example of the same kind of thing. So <clears throat> the idea is that even without active participation here, um, vicarious learning arises from active listening and watching. So the audience are not just kind of sitting back passively. They're not actually engaged in the dialogue because the dialogue is going on between um, some other learner or learners and the teacher. But nonetheless, the audience are kind of actively listening and watching. This seems to be an important element of what's going on. Um, they are, you know, somehow trying to really get something out of a kind of vicarious participation in the activity. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute, but it's important to try and distinguish this, I think, from um, the idea of observational learning. So um, in the past, people have often talked about observational learning, which is learning by observing things. Um, but typically, they're observing performance of some kind, which is very often an expert performance. And um, I want to differentiate vicarious learning from that because this is, vicarious learning is based on access to the learning process somehow or other. So one actually has to have a learning process taking place um, rather than just an expert performance. And then the learners who are watching this are getting something out of watching the learning itself. And this might be done using technology. So here's an old picture which some of the people in the room <laughs> will recognise. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> this is um, suggesting that, that um, you know, the, uh, the student over here um, is learning by um, watching the learning activity which is going on over here, which is um, being replayed to her, in this case, in the form of video. So perhaps um, we can capture learning experiences and um, relay them somehow for the benefit of other learners. So we had a research program um, which kind of tried to attack this problem. Um, and this was quite a long time ago that um, I and others first here around here first started looking into this kind of um, question. Well, in fact, Terry Mays, who is with us, I'm pleased to say, um, Terry Mays um, was working on this um, <clears throat> sometime before I was, and then we got into a project with Gene McKendry and various other people and tried to develop the technologies um, a bit further to think about how we could really um, do this sort of thing. So we focused on the capture of dialogue that was dialogue around specific problems. 
text, really. So the idea is that um, <coughs> we could capture these dialogues, and obviously the value of dialogue is that um, somehow the issue which is being discussed is being discussed. So it's being, um, it's being made explicit in some sense. It's being, um, you know, kind of, it's not entirely hidden. So you can get at it if there's a dialogue about it. Um, so <coughs> we would collect these dialogues, we would rate them for the quality of the learning content, match them to the specific needs of learners, hopefully, um, which would imply the use of them in a, in a controlled and perhaps intelligent environment, which was difficult. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, these were often based on um, things that we called task-directed discussions, which were little sort of dialogue games that um, people were um, invited to participate in, which helped to generate um, interesting and, and perhaps valuable learning dialogues, discussions. And we had to do this because um, these kinds of um, discussions didn't necessarily arise naturally all the time in ordinary tutorials. So um, we needed to try and stimulate them somehow so that we could capture them. Well, the outcomes of this were um, quite interesting and substantial. I mean, this was a research project. Well, there were two projects, in fact. It was a sort of program that went on for some while. And um, <clears throat> I don't have time to go into it in much detail here, but the outcomes um, kind of highlighted things like the benefit of exposure to student-student discussion. So um, we had these students who were watching discussions, and we were able to compare the discussions that they were exposed to in which students were discussing some problem, compared with um, tutor-student instruction, for example. So if we had a, a tutor who was um, simply expounding, more or less, some kind of um, material to students, um, that was much less valuable to the students than um, for the, to the students who were watching it, than um, a discussion in which you know the um, the student's perspective, so to speak, on the material was more highlighted. So, if students were discussing the material, then um, one found out much more effectively how the students were thinking about it, and that seemed to be useful to the students who were watching. Um, and students who were watching were able to identify much more with um, strugglers, for example. That means students who were struggling with the material rather than finding it very easy. So um, if students were finding the material very easy, then watching their discussions was less useful to um, other students, perhaps not too surprisingly, because obviously less problems were being, um, were being brought to the fore. But um, although students didn't like watching strugglers so much, they actually benefited more from it. Vicarious learning, we found, was effective in promoting reflection and discussion. Um, there were both cognitive and social benefits um, of watching these kinds of discussions. And there was impact, especially, it seemed, from the modeling, in some sense, of dialogue skills. So um, people who were watching relatively skilled dialogue taking place in the sense that it stayed on topic, for example, um, would tend to model those skills. They would tend to pick those skills up. And there seemed to be benefits from the kind of empathic identification that students had with each other. We had less clear-cut evidence for domain learning in the sense that um, people um, didn't clearly learn the subject material um, necessarily much better um, when they were exposed to the vicarious learning materials. But they did um, learn these techniques for learning, which um, itself is um, perhaps a valuable opportunity for distance learners. Um, and others like that, who are trying to understand how, how to get into a disciplinary framework. So in some sense, if you're trying to learn um, um, an academic discipline like, I don't know, physics or um, history or whatever, you're kind of being enculturated in the sense that you're becoming a physicist or a historian or whatever. And um, for distance learners, it's actually quite difficult to go through that enculturation because you need to be exposed um, to discussion and um, you know, the, the language of the discipline in, um, in an effective way, which this seemed to be able to achieve to some extent. And there are you know, discussions in the literature which 
I won't go into in this context, but people like Diana Lorillard and, and Donald Schoen and so forth have, um, have discussed in some detail these kinds of issues. So after that, um, another project that we had was um, a collaboration, this time funded by the ESRC Teaching and Learning Research Program, um, involving some of the same people, and in particular Richard Cox, um, Susan Rabold, I'm very pleased to see up there, <laughs> and um, Rosemary Varley from Sheffield, Julie Morris from um, Nottingham, and Kirsty, who worked in, in Nottingham as well, no, Sheffield rather. Anyway, they um, were all working on a, a system for trainee speech therapists. So there existed already um, a system called Patsy, which was a diagnostic practice system, really, um, for speech, trainee speech therapists to learn how to um, carry out the uh, assessment of a patient. So here, um, is uh, kind of an example. You would have things like a movie. You, you would have uh, maybe a movie of the patient here, um, which might appear. Well, it's not really one of the patients, but anyway. <laughs> um, and then um, you might have um, something like a, a medical history of, um, of the patient here. So these kinds of things could be augmented with um, various other resources. So in this project, we um, augmented those with dialogues that were actually based um, largely on, on these little TDD games that I was talking about before, the task directed discussions. Um, and <clears throat> we used those in interventions that were based on a sophisticated student model. So when the um, student speech therapists were trying to diagnose what was going on with a particular um, virtual patient, they would go through some process um, that might involve um, looking at test results, for example, looking at the video, um, that kind of thing. And there would be different sequences in which they could do these things. And um, we had a student model which prescribed that they should do these things in certain sequences, but not others, if they were doing an effective diagnosis of that particular case. And if they weren't going in um, what appeared to be an, an effective direction, then we would intervene by presenting them with um, one of these little dialogues. And this was supposed to kind of suggest to them other ways of thinking about what they were doing that might be useful, and so on. This was actually quite effective, um, but um, there were various problems with it. And one problem is that it was obviously very complicated and expensive to construct, so um, it took um, a three-year project with quite a lot of funding to actually build this thing and um, make it work. And to repurpose it for um, a different domain than um, trainee speech therapists would be, again, a complicated and expensive task. So there were difficulties with um, this kind of approach, which, um, although it could be quite effective, suggested to us that it would be perhaps fruitful to think about um, a different kind of approach. So here's another approach, which um, I don't know how visible those things are, but this is what leads in the direction of the thing we called YouTube. So here, um, probably I can make this bigger. Um, we had the idea that one can recycle stuff. One can collect video recordings of tutorial groups, for instance, um, and <coughs> kind of repurpose these videos by putting them on a website for access by other learners. Um, ideally, the videos would be automatically segmented by topic, um, although, in fact, they're manually segmented in the case of um, the implementation that we created. And um, students could create a, a, develop, a, a group activity of some sort around selecting and annotating these videos. Um, which would create a dynamic and customized learning resource, so that's the idea. This um, particular graphic here um, comes from uh, a poster or a leaflet and also a poster that was um, prepared in the hunt for European funding for this um, particular idea which still hasn't materialized unfortunately but um, we're continuing to search for um, funding of, of various kinds that will help us to take this idea further. In the meantime we got funding from the University of Edinburgh um, which had 
an excellent thing called the Principles e-learning fund and um, that funded a number of relatively small projects to, um, to do with e-learning and this was one of them. And um, on this project we had Susan Rabold um, and Neil Mayo and, and John O'Blander and Stuart Anderson who are also here. And um, <coughs> this was an attempt to take forward that idea that I was just talking about. So the idea was that we could recycle tutorial activity that was captured on video and instead in this case of trying to um, categorize somehow the videos and decide in advance which ones were going to be useful for learning and then feed them to the students. Um, that would become the students' um, own responsibility. The students themselves would have the job of looking at these videos and deciding which ones might be the most useful, or which bits of them might be the most useful. Because obviously in a, a tutorial that might be 50 minutes long, um, there could be quite a lot of material there which isn't all that interesting or useful. Um, but none, none, nonetheless, there could be little nuggets which um, would really be good to capture. So <clears throat> we thought the, um, the effects might be enhanced if the learners can edit the videos to, to pick out specific points, annotate these videos to highlight issues and things like that, and rework the content somehow to, <clears throat> to enhance their learning. And we wanted them to be able to develop this as a sort of community activity, um, reuse earlier learning episodes, integrate into other curriculum activities, and so forth. So here's a picture of um, our main prototype system. Um, now, I'm not going to attempt to run that system. <laughs> and um, that's, that's because... Um, uh, it, it does still work, but the, um, the technology is getting slightly out of date. It was, it was probably about three or four years ago that it was last really developed. And um, as ever, if one doesn't have the resource to keep these things um, you know, continually polished up, they start to fall into disrepair somehow just through other things moving along and, and, um, and somehow overtaking them, the development of the browsers and things like this. So, um, <clears throat> this particular version, nonetheless, is, is a sort of um, canonical example, where over here we've got the, um, the three videos, in this case, running together in sync. So there's a video which comes from the smart board on which the tutor or students might be writing stuff. Um, we've got um, a video stream from a camera that's looking into the tutorial room and a video stream from a camera that's looking towards the smart board. And... Um, <clears throat> The students can, can choose various um, elements of this and even here we've got um, the questions that might be discussed in the tutorial. So um, the students can actually use this to uh, relive, in some sense, the tutorials, either tutorials that they were involved in or tutorials that, um, that they weren't, but um, that, that discussed the same material perhaps. Well, actually, this um, system here was subsequently reworked in a student project by a, an undergraduate student there called um, Marcin Bott, who was uh, quite a good student, and um, he uh, re-implemented that for some reason, um, <clears throat> in a sense. Um, he felt that um, the, the sort of technology that it used wasn't, um, wasn't as easy to rework as he wanted to be able to do, um, and he was probably right there. But he also felt that um, a redesign of the interface would make it more friendly to students. So this was um, his idea, really, of a more student-friendly interface, and maybe, maybe he was right, I don't know, it's brighter anyway. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> one can see here the, um, the, the video is actually running, and we can... Um, go through them if we want, and uh, eventually it catches up. And um, that's, that's sort of quite useful perhaps. And, and down here we've got the chutes. Chutes are what we call the little segments of these videos which we were able to um, identify, for example, um, chutes that belonged to particular questions that were discussed for some period of time in the tutorial. So here we have this means week two, question one. We could jump to that. And um, just that piece there of the um, tutorial is dedicated to that particular question. 
and um, you can actually create new ones if you want. I won't do that because I'm running out of time, but um, <coughs> so I should cancel it. And um, you know, there's one that I created and, and so on. So um, one can see how this would work and there were plenty of tutorials to go at because we collected quite a few um, due to the very hard work of Susan who um, videoed these things and um, did all the work of um, uploading them and everything else. So this was um, quite a, a useful resource and um, we worked with it for several years really while we had um, funding to do that and um, some useful observations came out of it. Um, which I thought I had on slide, but I don't. Anyway, um, <coughs> there, were, there were useful observations in particular that um, it was especially good for um, students who funnily enough had failed the exam because <laughs> they found it um, a, a very valuable resource for revising when they were away from Edinburgh um, because they were able to um, rework the um, tutorial material and um, go over it again and um, that seemed to be um, very useful to them. So I think this um, system could be taken further and developed and there's various um, aspects of it that have been built into various proposals for further development. Individualizing the tute collections more um, so that people can have their own collection and share some of them but not necessarily all of them, that sort of thing. A more developed social networking model, more interactive virtual editing, these kinds of things. But in particular, integration with recorded lectures would obviously be um, a potentially valuable um, next step because now that such a, a large number of, of lectures are actually recorded, um, being able to um, intercut, as it were, pieces of lecture with the videos, uh, with the videos of um, tutorials, things like that could be um, a very valuable way to go. And of course, further work on um, automated identification of useful tutes and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> I just wanted to finish really by um, going back to the idea of really rich media. Um, it's not an entirely new idea because the idea of mashup and remix um, is, is very much there with us in um, digital culture, if you like. And, um, indeed increasingly in education. There's plenty of tools for doing this sort of thing. iMovie, of course. Um, there's this thing called the Open Movie Editor, which is, um, in a sense, um, a sort of open source version of that kind of tool. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is the idea of being able to do this sort of thing with materials that are completely online and um, creating links and a, a sort of ecosystem of materials that are completely online. And even that has um, plenty of um, precedent. There's this thing called Diver, which um, was developed in Stanford. And uh, it's quite a, a nice idea. Um, in Diver, you can do what um, Roy P and uh, his collaborators call guided noticing um, on any audio or video source. So you can, you can sort of um, focus on parts of a video and um, home in on it. So it's not kind of working with video clips so much as working with a continuous video that you, you um, focus on some element of in an interesting way and share that perhaps on the internet. So um, that's quite a useful idea. There used to be a thing called jumpcut.com which um, allowed you to edit videos online. Mysteriously, it was purchased by Adobe, no, not Adobe, um, Yahoo, I think it was. It was purchased by Yahoo and subsequently disappeared. Uh, I don't quite know why. <laughs> but um, <laughs> recently, and as far as I can tell, this is, um, this is really quite recent, there's, um, there's a thing called Adobe Premiere Express, which is a bit like that, or at least it allows people to develop things a bit like um, jumpcut.com jump, jump in that um, you can actually have an online video editor. Um, and that, that's quite a, an interesting development, I think, which um, we should pay more attention to. But obviously the problem with it is it's very um, proprietary and um, probably very expensive. So these things exist, and really the question is how to use them. That's what I want to say. And um, I don't think we really know yet how we should use them, but I, I think perhaps we've got some useful pointers in that direction. So 
in future, I'd like to see um, the development of further integration of these ideas with other learning systems. Um, I've got at least one EU proposal um, in the system somewhere um, that, if it comes through, will give us money to do this sort of thing. So we'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> we'd like to improve automated annotation of video. Um, in, in informatics, at least, there's um, quite a bit of work going on on the segmentation of these kinds of media um, using speech and or image processing to um, understand more clearly what it is that's actually in the, um, the medium itself. And I think we could um, apply these things elsewhere, for example, in schools. So um, with um, a guy called Tom Kane, who may be here. Yeah. Oh, yes, there he is. <laughs> um, who who um, works in a, a small local company called Precedence C Communications, who works with schools using video conferencing. Um, I think it would be interesting to investigate how we can work on you know, reusing these kind of um, materials within schools as well. And um, just to close, I've been um, trying to look at how that might happen. Um, with some things like this. So here is um, one of Tom's video conferences happening. <laughs> and um, I'm not going to show very much of this and certainly not any of it that involves any of the children. But um, what I've um, had a look at here, as well as the idea of having clips, which are like shoots, um, is the idea of having an actual sequence where there's a sequence of clips which um, one can sort of move through in this sort of way, um, thus capturing some of the ideas of um, things like jumpcut.com, which seem to have disappeared. And I think this, this kind of possibility that um, just allows us to personalize these um, kinds of media in various ways could be something that um, would be useful for school students in particular to help them to play with these kinds of media. OK, um, I'm going to stop there. Only two or three minutes over, I hope. So yeah. thanks very much. Uh, thank you, John, very much on behalf of all of us. I, mean, I think we all agree, a very thoughtful and thought-provoking lecture, really inviting us to think about new ways of cognition and the exploitation of this rich and very rich uh, uh, digital media. Will you join me in that time-honoured way to thank our lecturer tonight on the achievement of his personal chair, but perhaps what that really is based on, the achievement of a lifetime of work. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>